So over the last few years, I've been kind of exploring how to improve on this set of methodologies. Uh, basically bringing in the perspective of macroecology and biogeography. Then to let's look at disease systems from an ecological and biogeographic perspective, not just from a spatial perspective. So let's talk a bit more about this black box versus component model. Here's a very nice diagram that was published a couple of years ago. We have a landscape, and across that landscape, we have distributions of the various components of the transmission system. It might be a vector, a host, another host, and humans. Okay? You put all those together with certain assumptions about how they interact. And you get this true incidence pattern. And so that's essentially where humans get infected or where this host gets infected or where the vector gets infected. Essentially where it is the pathogen. Okay? But then you have all sorts of filters. And those filters may be whether the doctors know how to diagnose that particular disease, whether the doctors report that disease, whether the people go to doctors, all sorts of filters. And so that essentially takes this true pattern and translates it. And you may only see part of the true picture. Okay? So we could, in theory, reconstruct each of these, each of the components, and put them together in a simulation and produce a component-based risk factor. That's ideal, that's fascinating, but it fails on two points. One is, we don't know about some of these filters. But some of those filters are part of risk, and the other is, it's very, very hard to compile all of this information. Okay? Believe me, I've tried. The other way into this is via what I call the black box. You take all of this process here, all of this mechanistic uh, stuff that is the transmission system, and you just imagine you're turning the crank on that system, and at the end, this is what you get. So you can also develop a black box-based risk estimates. Now, in the ideal world, do both. If you can do both, then you can look at the difference between them and you can estimate these filters. Okay? Just as I've been telling you guys all week, the biggest problem in implementing this framework, very, very simply, is data. The model will look at the simulation to the data. Okay, that's what it all comes down to. Anyway, um, let's get the concepts right. So here's an example of a black box uh, based study. I already showed you these slides. But these were essentially uh, human cases of infection with aspects. Uh, here in East Africa, there's a little bit more detail. And there's the final risk map with these darker areas being uh, tagged by the model as a higher risk. I'll give you a part of a component-based approach. I set this particular example in partly because it was a collaboration with Enrique. Is that your only disease paper? No. No? Okay. Uh, but also partly because it gives you a view, we were talking about uh, temporal dynamics. And this gives you a little bit of an illustration of, of kind of a, a way forward. Those are distributional data for Aedes aegypti in 1995 across Mexico. And if I just relate those to remotely sensed data, like the ABHRR data that some of you have been playing with, uh, I get this. And so this is a map of where that species is across Mexico, blind to the seasonal dynamics caused by weather patterns and things like that. Okay? And 
essentially what this model tells me is that dengue is present in Mexico below about 500 years of elevation. And I already knew that. I mean, dengue is a tropical disease. Mexico has temperate parts and it has tropical parts. So I really don't learn much from this model. I mean, it's telling me what I already knew. So if I zoom in, I know that these are huge lowland areas, okay? So we want to see if we can do something better than that. So this is coloring those occurrence points by the month in which they were collected. And the perfect illustration, you guys saw the pictures of my house the other day, and that nice picture in the springtime, that's May or June, there will be mosquitoes. There's no dengue transmission, but there is West Nile virus transmission. But in those other photographs where you saw the house under a foot of snow, there are no mosquitoes. Okay, there's seasonal differences. In Mexico, you don't have big snowstorms in most of the country, but you do have wet and dry cycles, and you have all sorts of seasonal dynamics. So this is taking those occurrences and splitting them up by month. And then, for example, those are the occurrences in August. And we can take those occurrences and relate them to the environmental characteristics in August. And we get this map. And what I want you to notice is that the areas are much less continuous than in that original map. Even better, I can, in theory, take the conditions leading up to August. Maybe June and July. Build a model and anticipate where the mosquito will be in August. So this is a model built based on June and July environmental characteristics and tested using independent data from August. Okay? And what you see is generally quite good correspondence. And I can tell you that the correspondence was statistically significant highly statistically significant. So this is just to go back to our first set of models. The yellow is the August model built in a time-specific sense, and the red is that time-ignorant uh, model. And what you can see is that yellow areas are far smaller than the year-round areas. And in fact, in August, we even get yellow areas where there are no um, suitable areas reconstructed in the year-round analysis. So essentially what we're, what we're finding is that month by month we learn some new things about these data. So we're going closer and you can see that the August points predicted by the June-July model projected to August conditions, the August points are actually quite coincident with the yellow areas. In fact, here and here, there are yellow pixels sitting under those points. So those are not model failures, they're just tiny areas of, of predicted suitability. And so what we found out of the seven months where a test was possible, basically five of those months yielded statistically significant uh, predictions. Not perfect. Pretty encouraging. Really interesting was then that we took our areas of risk identified by the uh, month specific models. We calculated the number of days that it takes to hatch a mosquito, get it infected, let it digest that blood meal that's infected, and bite another human and infect the human and the human develops symptoms. So you count the number of days that all of that takes, and you can develop a risk map, uh, essentially for transmission to humans, that is temporally explicit. We did that for each of five months. Those are the dengue cases, and in all five months, the prediction of where dengue cases would occur X number of days later was statistically significant. Um, these data were limited, but the promise is there that we have the potential for essentially 
real-time disease forecasting based on components of disease cycles. So essentially that was an illustration of this sort of approach. Let's go on to some multiple data set studies. I just want to give you an idea. I think I mentioned this too before, that, that a lot of the, the value in these models that you guys have been learning about comes from the question, not from the fact that you ran the model. And so thinking about the question, um, we can ask questions like this. What determines uh, plague distributions across its range in North America? That's a pretty tough question. Uh, but we had a couple of data streams that were quite interesting. Basically, we knew where plague cases had occurred in humans. We knew it was a huge data set that was not in digital format, and my colleagues and I had to have it digitized. That was only two years of work. But we knew where plague had been detected in North American mammals. That was a neat data set. And we know a lot about the distribution of those mammals. So this paper was essentially putting that together. And so we, we decided to compare two hypotheses. One hypothesis is that essentially plague is as plague does, and that it has some uh, inherent environmental footprint where it is transmitted. And that mammal species get infected where they overlap that suitable area for plague. Uh, the other hypothesis is one that's more oriented towards hosts, that you have an appropriate set of hosts, and that essentially the assemblage of host distributions creates the plague distribution. And I haven't forgotten that plague is transmitted by fleas. So really, this hypothesis is plague or its vectors. Okay? But there's a data stream that I haven't been able to get my hands on. Please ignore them there. So essentially, here are those two hypotheses. Under the plague niche hypothesis, there is some potential distribution of plague, and all of these, oh, sorry, sorry, all of these other mammals, these, these, these hosts, get infected when they enter into that area. And on the other side, we can imagine the plague distribution being essentially an assembly of appropriate host distributions. So what we did was we built two sets of models for each host. We built a model for its overall distribution. Those are the blue points and the red model. And we built a model of its plague infected distribution based on the black point about 4,000 cases of plague detection in mammals that went into building this study. So we did that for each group of hosts, and we get this array, which is, which is kind of interesting. Here is essentially the footprint of where plague is being transmitted in North America. We get that from, from human cases plus animal cases. And here are the distributions of each of nine groups of hosts. Now all I want you to see is this, so this is the entire geographic distribution of each of those hosts characterized without reference to play. Where you see gray, we find uh, we, we were able to reject niche similarity. So that's basically saying that the overall distribution of these hosts and uh, where the, the background for those hosts uh, differ. So which is, which is a way of saying these host species don't just get infected or show plague infections kind of randomly across their whole distributions. But if I compare where each of these hosts is known to have been infected with plague, And that actually relates in a similar way, that's the white, to where plague has been found. 
So essentially what we find is that mammal hosts don't get infected across their whole ranges, but rather they get infected where they overlap this plate background. Okay? So that takes us, sorry, that takes us pretty clearly towards the plate niche hypothesis, which my belief is that it's not the pathogen per se, but rather the vectors. And someday we'll assemble a nice distributional data set for the vectors, and we can do a more complete component-based approach to plate merit. Take a quick look at um, leishmaniasis. BAK is digital accessible knowledge. So this is essentially what data are available out there on the internet. You can see the whole world is pretty poorly <coughs> documented as far as sample distributions. But this is Brazil, and you can see Brazil is quite well documented. The Brazilian Public Health Foundation, Pierre Cruz, has done a very nice job of, of getting major important data sets digitized and available online. So there's quite a resource.